a superpower on a charm offensive. The United States is all in on Africa's future. African leaders lending an ear and open for business, but no longer desperate because they have options. Benefactors and partners from the East in investment, development, firepower. It's been a continent exploited for its vast riches, decade after decade, seeing little of it for itself. Well, there is a long history of Africa's resources being used by the global economy, being used, quite frankly, to create the industrialization that we see in, in Europe, in the U.S. It is the resources of Africa that drove that industrialization, yet, yet Africa did not benefit. Is this the time everything changes? Does Africa know how much it's worth? This is The Interview. Amira Woods is Executive Director of Green Leadership Trust and Ambassador for Africans Rising for Justice. She joins us from New York. Amira, good to have you on The Inner View. It seems as if the United States might be a little bit late to the party when it comes to engagement with Africa. Is that too cynical or am I right? Well, you can say late to the party. You can also say the U.S. has been engaged with Africa for a long time, as has been the rest of the world. Let's remember the resources that fuel the global economy come from Africa whether it's oil or gas or mining, there has been for centuries an outflow of resources, including Imran, you know, human resources coming from the continent of Africa that has driven the industrialization of not only the U.S., but also uh, Europe and the Western world. So I would say, you know, that party, unfortunately, has been going on for far too long, and it has been to the detriment of African and Africans, wherever they may be, uh, on the continent and throughout the diaspora. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's a bit cynical to say, you know, they're late for the party, but because I think we've got to pull back the lens of mm. history and understand, you know, they've, they've been uh, benefiting uh, for far too long. Okay, so let me ask that in a different way. There's been historically an exploitative relationship on all levels, from slavery to other resources beyond human chattel and uh, tremendous human rights violations over the years. There's been more engagement in recent years done by others, the Chinese, the Russians, which also has its own layers and levels of exploitation. And we can, we, we can separate that out and debate that and discuss it. But the United States has not really done much engaging in recent years, and now it's trying to play catch up. Would that be true? Well, I think that is partly right. What we see this, this century seems to be shaping up as a century where the U.S. and China, uh, you know, uh, will, will begin this global, well, will continue a global battle for dominance. And so what you see are these geopolitical actors uh, finding uh, new areas in which they can pursue a quest for resources. It's not new, but it has been intensified. Certainly the, the Belt and Road Initiative of China uh, centers Africa in terms of, especially African resources, uh, in terms of the, the initiatives uh, uh, for growth that are being planned uh, for China. But you see also that the US in this, this quest, uh, this quest for global dominance, uh, wants to maintain uh, its, its, uh, its, its role in the global economy and is looking uh, to Africa as well for those resources. And you can add others, like, you know, uh, certainly Russia has expanded its, its influence on the continent, many others as well. Uh, so I think this is, again, the centrality of Africa for the global economy. It is not a new phenomenon, but it has certainly intensified. So you have seen every two years, China has the China Africa Forum, right, where yeah. um, heads of states come together to again prioritize uh, an engagement uh, with Africa. And, and so, you know, Beijing for every two years, for the last eight years or so, has, has had 
uh, these, these series of summits. Um, the U.S., it seems like it's every eight years, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? It was with the Obama administration and, and now uh, again with, with the Biden administration. In between, we had the Trump administration, which was quite frankly uh, humiliating, disastrous in terms of its uh, framing of a relationship with Africa. Um, but, but regardless, you have had an interest in Africa's resources, a steady flow of Africa's resources out of the continent into these other areas, and, um, and often uh, uh, rendering communities on whose land those resources lie invisible. And, and that is the core of the problem, right? That, that, that Africa has enriched the, 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 the rest of the world uh, at the expense of the health, the well-being, uh, of, 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 of Africans, whether they are on the continent or in the diaspora. Can we extend that and say that Africa has not only enriched the rest of the world and, and not itself, but it's also enriched its own leadership, but those leaders don't let that wealth trickle down to their people because built into this horrible system we have despots and dictators and people that Western nations, like the United States, like the Chinese, don't have a problem doing business with. As long as they get the job done, they don't really care about the people on the ground. Thank you again for just hitting the right questions. I think the, the, the key thing is also pulling back for histor historical analysis here, because I think we've got to recognize that Africa has actually had phenomenal leaders. We had in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, for example, Patrice Lumumba. Patrice Lumumba was a visionary leader, came out of the ranks of the trade unions in the country, right? And, and so what you see was a leader thinking about the interests of his people, Putting the, the yeah, but, but the CIA doesn't like like those types. Exactly, was killed at the hands of the U.S. and 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 the and, and the U.K. It's now been well documented. Mm. And, and put in his place was Mobutu, incredible like uh, kleptocrat, right? Mm. And, and so so it was a deliberate effort to strip away the ability of people to determine their future, to choose their leaders freely, to hold those leaders accountable. And that has gone on for decades. And that's just the Democratic Republic of the Congo. If we take Burkina Faso in West Africa, where I'm from, Burkina Faso had Thomas Sankara. He was not only um, a feminist, had, had equity in pay in the 1980s, right? Equity in pay for men and women in the 1980s. He was also an environmentalist, again, putting the interests of his people first, and he was also assassinated. It may have been at the hands of others, but it was orchestrated outside of the continent and at the hands of, of, of the West. So I think we've got to pull back and understand that the leadership has been there, that leadership has been destabilized for the interests of those who want to seek the resources at all costs. And so what I think in terms of leadership is that leaders have to be held accountable. And we actually have now a young generation of, of, of African leaders, young people coming out of activism, whether they're in, and they're, they're literally all over the continent from, from you know, from, from Uganda to, you know, um, Senegal, there, there are musicians who are coming up. There are activist poets coming up in new and interesting ways. What they're doing, they're putting the interest of the of their country first. And I think these new young leaders, by the way, and some of them are women as well, let's be clear, right? These new young leaders are, I think, you know, in, in this coming century, they are a force to be reckoned with because they are thinking about um, issues of equity in a really deep way. And they're, they're, they're environmentalists thinking about the impact of, of, um, of, of, eco of economic um, matters on the environment. They're thinking about the health of their people coming out of this global pandemic and preparing, needing to prepare for future pandemics. But most importantly, they're looking at ways in which Africa's resources can, can, can be developed in sustainable ways, whether it's you know, um, sustainable agriculture or um, looking at renewable energy or looking at technology in new and creative ways. This is the force of a continent of 1.4 billion people, predominantly young leaders, right? Mm -hmm. That is coming up in this century. That's the leadership that I think needs to, to, to be elevated. Um, leaders who are focused on peace, focused on justice, focused on the environment. They're there, Armin. When, when those leaders made the trip across the Atlantic to 
Washington, D.C. and met with President Biden and people from the State Department, the White House. When they met with him, would they have been streetwise to the fact that the U.S. does need them, maybe more than they need the U.S., given the geopolitics that we had mentioned at the beginning of the conversation? I think I mean, for far too long, we have leaders that are paying more attention to the capitals in other places as opposed to their own people, their own country, right? So often they're coming, whether it's to Beijing or to Washington, they're coming without understanding the power that they have. Mm. Right? It's almost like they're not leveraging their power. They're, they're many politicians, regardless of the country, they do this. They look at the short term, the next election, it's their focus, right? And and you often have people, social movements, you know, change has often come from, from social movements, whether it's the anti-apartheid movement or, um, or the civil rights movement in the United States, it's people from the bottom pressuring, pushing for change. And so, you know, so th there are some that, that will listen to, 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 to their, um, their, their, their population, their citizens, their people. But, you know, for far too long, there's much more attention paid to what's coming out of Beijing or Washington or, or now Moscow and other places or the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund because of the, the sense of what needs to happen for the next election. And I think, you know, it, it, is, it is important to recognize and for leaders to also understand that, you know, the interests of their people must come first. The interests and protection of, of, the, of the planet <laughs> should right. go far above um, the, the extraction yeah. of resources at the expense of people and planet. When, when I looked at some of the details of what had come out of that meeting at the summit, some encouraging news, I saw that trade deals were struck where AFCFTA, which is the African continent's um, uh, sort of continental business uh, alliance, if you like, beyond borders, where the continent would try to act as a single market and they're trying to implement that. They struck some, some deals, which could be to the tune of billions of dollars if these things come to fruition. And then we also saw the $55 billion pledged by Joe Biden to the continent. Now, on the one hand, you go, okay, that's nice. On the other hand, you go, well, 55 nations, $55 billion. It sounds as if some bureaucrat went, hmm, that's, that's nice, maybe one billion for each one of those countries, whether they're, they're Swaziland or Nigeria, right? So when you looked at some of the details that came out of the meeting, was there anything that came out of it that made you think this is going to properly, deeply, from the bottom up, um, contribute to a positive legacy so that we don't look at this eight years from now as we look at the previous summit and go, well, it was just a, a talking shop and, and nothing came out of it? Oh, what a great question. And I think the answer there is that, you know, <laughs> it was largely as eight years ago and as have been the, the, the China for largely the factory, largely the photo ops, right? Let's just put that squarely on the table, largely perfunctory. But I think um, the fact that our Africa is being, for the first time, and remember the U.S. typically and the U.S. foreign policy is designed to separate the continent. Sub-Saharan is separated from North Africa. It's deliberately like um, deep power, you know, taking away the power of the collective. So for the first time for Africa to say, we are a continental force, that there is now a continental free trade zone that has to, to, to put the, 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 the full interests of the continent, uh, the collective weight of the continent uh, first, um, that is an important step. I think the, the, um, the, the other issue is around uh, governance and global governance. So, so you know, clearly 1.4 billion people should have a permanent seat or more at the UN Security Council. Um, but for the first time, this is now put on the table where um, the U.S. is saying they will, they will support what, what the whole world should be supporting, which is greater African decision making in global governance. And so, you know, those those are steps in the right direction, right? And I think we've got to acknowledge that and lift that up. But at the same time, you have this, this 55 billion, and yes, it's laughable, especially when you look at what the US is spending on military, right? Mm. And what the US is spending in Ukraine, <laughs> right? Or one, one country, you know, all support for, 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 for peace 
in Ukraine, but we've got to put this in context. 55 billion um, is, is really a pittance when you think about what the US is extracting from the continent and the full value of the, of the illicit financial flow that is going in terms of tax avoidance or, or tax havens, but at, you know, at the expense of, you know, of Africa. It is US companies that are benefiting. It is, it is US corporations that are benefiting and it is US banks and, and, and lawyers and, and, and the rest, right? So US goods and services end up receiving an estimated 80% of the quote unquote um, US uh, uh, foreign, foreign, foreign dollars. So I think we've got to say that the, the foreign dollars are, are minimal when compared to the military. We've got to also understand that around the table of that summit, was the U.S. Department of Defense, mm. and they have far too long controlled much more of the of, of U.S. foreign policy than they should, and so so you 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 have almost like a destabilizing of Africa from at the hands of the U.S. military in the form of of weapons and ammunition and and U.S. Um, well, they're mercenaries. The U.S. they call them you know military contractors, but they are essentially mercenaries, right? And they are. Um, thriving, quite frankly, throughout the continent, um, destabilizing, particularly in, in resource-rich areas, so where, where the oil, gas, and mining, which is 90% of U.S. trade with Africa, right? In those areas where the oil, gas, and mining lie, this is where the U.S. military has traditionally and still today had its, its military influence. So if you pull back and you look at who wasn't in that photo op, which countries weren't invited, it was essentially the countries where there had been um, uh, recent coups. And if you look at you know, who orchestrated those recent coups, it was typically um, uh, military leaders that had been trained by the US Africa, US Africa Command, right? Military leaders trained by the US, then somehow find their way um, with weaponry and other areas uh, orchestrating uh, chaos on the continent. And, and quite recently we had you know, it was a glaring example. We had a high profile trade um, of, 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 you know, of, uh, I, I think of her, uh, of, um, uh, you know, an, an icon, a tennis, I'm sorry, a basketball icon from the, from the WNBA mm -hmm. was trading in a horrific, or a horrific, <laughs> um, as a, you know, mercenary arms dealer. Uh, Victor Bout, who, who played a role in, in my country, in Liberia, where during the war, weapons flowed at the hands from the U.S., from people like Victor Bout, you know, um, killed 250,000 Liberians, destabilized the country for decades, right? right. And it, this, is, this is what happens when the U.S. military goes forward. It is not often... Um, um, spoken about, but but it's the drones, it's the um, right. surveillance, it's the security. This yep. far out. We we also had of... yeah we, we we also had the Ghanaian leader complaining about the Wagner Group operating on the borders as well. So I mean, there's which which uh, contributes to what we were talking about earlier on, where it's it's a great scramble for Africa still, right? The Russians are on the ground, the, the U.S. are on the ground, the Chinese are on the ground in, in, in different ways. Um, I want to move this on to climate for a second, because a lot of people struggle to make the connection when they, when they hear of the concept of climate justice for Africa, because they, they want to understand, okay, why is there an imbalance and why is there a climate injustice when it comes to how Africa is affected by current climate change and policies to alleviate global warming and climate change. Tell us more about that, Amira. Well, that, thank you so much for asking always the right questions. This one is, is it's clear, like the, the global economy survives on these, these key minerals um, that have, you know, they've been gifted to the global south. It's not only the African continent, but it's really the global south that has been gifted with these tremendous resources. But in Africa, we have had the gold, the platinum, the diamonds. We have also had the oil, right? And and and, and the gas. So it is, if you think about it, it is it is the gifts of these natural resources um, that has been also a curse in terms of the extractive process that has um, created such devastation, whether it's the, the oil 
um, that then spills in riverways that people are drinking from and bathing from, or it's the um, the mining, you know, like, you know, coltan, for example, again, Democratic Republic of the Congo has 80% of the coltan of the world, right? And without coltan, you cannot have cell phones, right? And so if you think about these resources needed for the global economy, they've been gifted to, to Africa and the global south. And yet extraction of those resources has led to devastation of the planet. So the planet is warming, right? And it is it is estimated that, that the warming is actually going on at a far more rapid pace than even the scientists have, have predicted. And so what you have is places in the global south, like Africa, um, well documented now that we we are um, um, facing far more um, harm in terms of global warming, and we did not contribute as we talked about before, right? The resources were extracted and others benefited. Industrialization happened in the West, in in Europe, in the U.S., right? We did not benefit those polluters, those who benefited from the fossil fuel extraction, right? Um, are, uh, should pay uh, uh, the, the heaviest cost to the damage, to the harm done. And so what many are calling for is real kind of reparations, climate reparations, understanding that we are suffering the, the heaviest cost. And again, this is we as in Nigeria where the oil started to be extracted back in 1956, right? But it's also we, as we look at where refineries are in the United States, places like New Orleans and the Gulf South that are predominantly black, brown, and indigenous spaces. It is those areas that have been heavily polluted with the fossil fuel extraction and the fossil fuel economy. So when we think about the climate chaos that's been created and we're demanding a better world, We've got to put first the interests of those communities that have suffered the greatest harm. So that would mean climate finance, to make sure that there is renewable energy that is fueling a, 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 a green future for the planet, right? And, and you know, so, so we call for, you know, it's, it's a, a green new deal, not yeah. only for the West, right? But a green new deal for the planet where people are, are able to have jobs. Again, young people throughout the African continent demanding jobs. But how does that, how does that work? I mean, does it take for the United States, the, the French, the Portuguese, um, the United Kingdom and other historical uh, colonizers and oppressors and exploiters to pay up or to engage or to trade? How does it, what does it look like moving forward? So yes, there it's a multiple you know, uh, answer for that, right? First, pay up. Yes, but reparations, reparations, reparations now. <laughs> Second, you know, we, we've got to have a, a global economy that is green, right? That begins to, to undo the harm done over these centuries and begins to put in place priorities that put first people and the needs of people for health for um, well-being, for a healthy environment around them, and I, and and so and and often it's it's listening to those um, black, brown, and indigenous people who have the solutions. Amira, thank you very much for joining us on the interview. I wish you all the best. Thanks again, Amira Woods. It is always a joy. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for giving space to this conversation. Stay strong. Mm -hmm.